Hey photographers, welcome back to the studio. At uh, risk of hurtling ourselves down the rabbit hole of vanity and self-adulation, we are going to photograph ourselves. After all, you're the cheapest model you'll ever have, and, well, you're just always around. So, uh, in this case, we're going to practice some camera techniques, um, some camera and lighting techniques, and it's really actually kind of a cool thing to be able to practice on yourself. That way, when you show up to photograph somebody else, you're you're not, you know, struggling to actually, you know, figure these things out in person. You can really just focus on your subject. Uh, in this case, um, we're going to talk a little bit about background uh, and side lighting. We're going to talk about where you might find that in your home. Um, I used a nice big window in a room that's sort of under construction at my house. It was great. Um, the diffu the plastic sort of diffused all the light that came into the room. It was real nice soft lighting. Um, I used a couple of different lenses and a couple of different aperture settings uh, and a couple of different camera angles. Uh, at the end of the video, then, we'll actually talk about some retouching. So first of all, let me just talk about the type of lenses um, that I used. So uh, I have a couple of quick examples here, right, of, of some end results. This camera lens was the 60 millimeter lens that I'd used in previous demonstrations. Um, and what I want you to pay particular attention to is um, the lack of distortion. Now, when I jump over to my 24 millimeter wide angle lens, you'll notice almost immediately that even though I didn't move the tripod, I didn't move myself, uh, I didn't change hardly any settings on the camera, just took one lens off, stuck the other on, um, dramatically different results in the way that these two images present the subject. Um, take a look at, for example, uh, what I'll kind of simplistically call the barrel distortion in the 24 millimeter lens and um, the lack of distortion in the 60 millimeter lens. Now you may not have um, these fixed lenses that you can just pull off and put on, but uh, many of you have a kit lens that has the ability to zoom in or zoom out. Um, this is a, a pretty good example of why you might want to use uh, a setting that's zoomed in, even if that forces you to step back away from your subject a little bit. Um, using a zoom out, uh, a wide angle lens, particularly if you're shooting in close proximity to your subject, um, is significantly going to distort your image. Now, let's just say, for example, that this is all um, you've got. You've only got a wide angle lens, but you, 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 know, you don't want to be stuck with the barrel distortion that exists. Well, um, there are a couple different things we can do. Uh, I'm going to go in through Photoshop here just to do a real quick uh, adjustment, and then I'll also show you in um, Camera Raw in a minute. Uh, but if you go to Filter, Lens Correction, there's a bunch of different things that uh, the camera could potentially do, the camera lens, sorry, could, uh, could do to distort your image. And so I'm going to turn off this lens correction and back on, and you'll see that um, just because Photoshop knows what kind of lens that I had on, the uh, uh, Nikon AF 24mm 2.8D, um, it can, uh, it sort of has some presets built into it to fix some of uh, the barrel distortion that was happening. Um, now, your lens may actually be stored in Photoshop's, um, you know, software. It may just be able to autocorrect for that. Now, to be honest, I actually don't think that this is enough. I don't think that it's corrected enough of the barrel distortion. So I'll come over here to custom and I'll just show you real quickly what I mean by barrel and pin cushion uh, or pin distortion. So uh, essentially I'll make it worse. Uh, this would be like an ultra wide angle lens, like maybe a fisheye 10 millimeter lens or something. Um, hugely distorted image. You can tell that uh, objects in the center of the image, uh, like my gigantic nose now, right, have really kind of overshadowed everything else. Take a look at how distorted the size of my eyes are compared to the size of my ears. Um, this is what a wide angle or a fisheye lens will do. Now, uh, to correct that, Photoshop will allow you to actually add, uh, it, it's, you, know, you can't really fix the problem, but you can add uh, some pin distortion, which is going to flex the image in the opposite direction. Essentially, it's going to bend the photograph almost by like pulling in the middle, shrinking all of the objects in the center of the image and expanding everything else. Now some weird things can happen, like look all of a sudden at the kind of lines that used to be straight in this room. That's a line that joins the ceiling to uh, the wall. That should be a straight line. If I turn on my grid, you can see that it definitely is not a straight line because I've added some distortion in order to correct the barrel distortion. It's starting to swoop. So while I may actually, you know, have been fixing some of the distortion in the image, I've messed up some of the room distortion. 
uh, buildings and architecture that should have straight lines is usually the dead giveaway uh, whether your lens is um, distorting the image or not. So I'll just cancel that for a second. So um, something to consider, right? Like what lens am I putting on? And once I have a lens on there, what, uh, what field of view or what um, optical range am I going to use? Now, let me switch over to my 60 millimeter lens for a minute and uh, take a little bit closer look at this image because um, there's also uh, some uh, aperture adjustments that we can make in this lens. And there's a dead giveaway uh, in this photograph that I was using a really wide open aperture. Uh, this lens, the 60, mil 60 millimeter lens, has a 1.8 aperture. And so I was shooting 1.8 or wide open. Now take a look at the depth of field. Uh, my ears, for example, on my head, I suppose, if you really want to kind of get specific, are a couple of inches behind the tip of my nose. Now, it looks like the camera focused uh, right on my nose or actually just behind my nose, maybe right on the lip, my lips. But uh, as I move back to the ears, it's soft or it's already starting to blur. This is a really great example of a narrow depth of field portrait uh, that's going to soften out everything behind. Uh, even you know the back of my neck where the scarf is, um, it's totally softening out, not to mention the background, right? Now there wasn't much in the background anyway, um, but you know uh, because I've shot with a narrow depth of field, it's really softened out anything that's back here. You'll hear photographers refer to this as the bokeh, right? That really gentle, soft focus in the background. Now you got to be careful though, with a camera that has the capability of shooting a 1.8 f-stop, um, you'll see that the frames of my glasses are in focus, but my eyes are actually slightly soft. They're slightly out of focus. Uh, this is because the depth of field is so narrow, it's probably an inch or less. And if I'm front focusing just a little bit, um, things like eyes, which are usually this really important part of the portrait, let's keep those sharp and in focus, well those can slip out of focus because the camera is looking at this really high contrast rim of the glasses or maybe this high contrast crease that cuts in between my lips. Um, so uh, the f-stop that you use uh, is really really important. Uh, if you want that nice soft focus maybe don't push it quite so low. Don't go all the way down to the very bottom. Maybe keep it at like 3.5 or uh, 4.5 um, aperture settings. Now uh, if you uh, want to keep all of this really crisp and really sharp, I actually should I actually uh, suggest shooting at maybe an f8 to f11 on most lenses. That's the sharpest aperture setting, and so you'll not only uh, get a little bit deeper depth of field and not accidentally lose the eyes in your subject. Um, but you'll actually just have a sharper image overall. Uh, one of the other things that uh, I worked with in uh, portrait session was the, the angle of the camera. Now, um, in this case, I'm no longer working with side lighting. I uh, rotated the camera and um, photographed myself with the light, with the window lighting me from behind. Uh, and because I exposed for uh, myself, um, it basically blew out everything else in the background, right? So there's two different ways to make use of a window, but uh, these three photographs, what I was really demonstrating were three different camera angles. The one in the center, I had set the camera up uh, more or less pointed straight at me at the level of my nose or so. And on the left, I photographed down on myself. And on the right, I photographed up at myself. Now, it's worth probably practicing with these three different angles. It wasn't a huge difference one to the next to the next. I'd probably only raised or lowered the camera a couple of feet. It's not like I was crawling around on the floor. Um, but it's a pretty significant difference one to the next to the next. Now, in terms of distortion, uh, it's possible that you could distort your subject so much that it would make, uh, say for example, their, their head feel like the wrong shape. This is particularly the case if you photograph up at somebody. Um, not to mention, you know, if you start looking up somebody's nose that sort of exaggerates their nostrils and starts to, you know, sort of be a bit of a funny uh, domineering sort of position. Uh, for this uh, type of headshot, I actually suggest just sort of set up a straightforward um, right at the level of the eyes or nose portrait session first and then try a few of these other ones. Now, um, in terms of some of the edits uh, that we'll do to pull this off, um, I'm going to do... Uh, I. I I think we've kind of talked quite a bit about, you know, how editing black and white exposures and stuff. So I won't go back and talk too much about black and white editing, um, but we will kind of venture into a bit of color editing today. 
and uh, talk about some uh, portrait editing specifics. So I'll reopen uh, one of these images with the side lighting and walk through uh, sort of a digital editing workflow. And it's probably not a bad idea to take a couple of notes and set up this workflow for yourself because some of these um, aren't just kind of interesting tips and tricksy kind of things, but the sequence that I do them in is, uh, is sort of important. So let me go back to my folder of images here and find the one. So I'll open this image into Camera Raw. And in Camera Raw, I'll start with my base edits. Uh, now generally, if I'm going to start by working in a color photograph, the very first thing I'm going to be paying attention to is the white balance. Now assuming that my exposure is more or less in the ballpark, uh, if I have to increase or decrease the exposure a little bit, um, I'll be messing with that in a second. But the white balance is going to be specific to sort of how my camera was in a relationship with the color or what we'll call the temperature of the, uh, of the lighting. Now, I was in a, a room that was just freshly painted white. Um, it was kind of afternoon cloudy day sun coming in sideways. That basically is a guarantee that I'm going to have an overly blue light source. And so my camera is attempting to kind of autocorrect for, um, uh, for a bunch of blue light. And, and the auto white balance feature on my camera did an okay job. If I start by just sort of referencing the white balance options that are in my camera, you'll notice that because I shot in RAW, um, I could set it to daylight uh, color toning, a cloudy white balance, a shade, and in each one of these sort of built-in presets for the camera, you'll notice that um, I have uh, radically different color spaces. Now some of these may get pretty close to, you know, the way I really want it. Uh, but the dead giveaway anytime you're photographing a person will be their skin tone, right? Like I'm not exactly sure what this background color should be, could be, would be, um, but I definitely know I'm highly sensitive to the color of people's skin. Um, that's not necessarily like, um, don't, don't think of that in terms of like, you know, discomfort around certain people. Think of it more like when you, uh, um, are reading somebody's emotions. Uh, the sort of color and temperature of their skin uh, can tell you a lot about them. If they're feeling ill, if they're angry, if they're feverish, if they're sad, um, all of those skin tone things, they kind of come at you visually first before you actually engage a lot of the kind of complex language around our relationships. So think about that. Think if, if somebody's too red, they don't look well. If somebody's too green, they don't look well. Um, if they're too blue, right, they're probably too cold. So the computer is always going to have these shifts between blue and yellow, what we'll call color temperature. This is right underneath my white balance settings. And our tints, too yellow or too red. Uh, sorry, too green and too red, or what we'll actually call magenta. And so uh, we'll be negotiating all of those mixing. And there are some presets, right? And there are some assists, but um, that's basically where we'll do all of our custom mixing. Uh, what I like to do is sort of get it roughly in the ballpark with some presets and then fine tune it with my temperature and tint sliders. So I'm going to use my white balance as shot, my built-in camera auto. Uh, but then I'm going to come up to my eyedropper tool, keyboard shortcut I, and I'll start selecting around my image uh, in areas that should be a mid-tone gray. Uh, now this uh, white balance tool, if I deliberately click on something that's wrong, you'll notice immediately how it completely resets the image um, to a different overall white balance. Uh, basically, this white balance tool is finding something that's about a mid-tone gray and rebalancing the entire image as a global edit. Uh, I find this tool to be really, really handy. Uh, even if I don't have a gray card or a mid-tone gray in the image, I can usually find something that's close. So this little fleck of gray here in my scarf or the background here is a little too green. So I think it's uh, pushing uh, my skin tones and the red spectrum a little bit too far. So I'll reset it to that um, gray here and I've got my skin you know close to where I think it needs to be um, now weirdly you'll notice that as you start to mix skin tones uh, you'll add colors that you don't typically think of people having in their skin tones like I actually need to mix in a little more green to bring the skin tones uh, in this image uh, into the right place so once my uh, white balances uh, are are roughly close uh, I may come in and do a little bit of exposure work global exposure work uh, I'm like actually you know I'm reasonably happy with where this one is at uh, I may just add a touch of dehaze because um, it was sort of a a foggy day and all the diffused light coming in the front of the room 
through that uh, plastic sheeting was really kind of uh, flattening a lot of the uh, tones in the image. Now, just before I jump into Photoshop, um, if you uh, if you want to do some of those lens corrections, just pay attention to a couple of the edits up here. Let's just say, for example, like even though I was shooting uh, my you know the best lens I had, I still have some distortion. Go here to lens corrections, and you can do a couple different uh, couple different techniques. You can do what's called a profile lens correction, uh, enable the profile correction, and if Photoshop can read which camera lens you were using, uh, it may fix those distortions for you. Uh, and you can kind of see what those distortions would be. Uh, in the case of my image, it looks like Photoshop is correcting a little bit of barrel distortion by giving it a bit of pincushion. I notice it right here in my cheek more than anything else. Um, but I'm also noticing that it's fixing a bunch of vignetting in the corners. Uh, vignetting would be um, darkness in the corners that uh, my camera lens adds, not as, a, not as like a nice effect, but as a, as a problem. Uh, in the image. If I want to do a manual correction, like if I feel like I really am more distorted than I ought to be, uh, I can actually um, add some uh, sort of pincushion distortion or barrel distortion in order to correct for my lens. Uh, I'm reasonably happy with, uh, with the profile corrections that were sort of in here, so I'm not going to add any extra pincushion. I'm a little distorted here because I was pretty close to the camera. But let's open this image now up in Photoshop. So in Photoshop, um, I like to have my layers palette open and my history palette open, but for the most part, I'm going to keep a pretty clean works workspace. Uh, I'm going to end up adding a whole lot of layers over here, so I just want to be able to see and manipulate each one of those. Um, but uh, before I do too much more with um, fine-tuning exposure or anything, if, if you want to layer exposures or kind of composite exposures together, go ahead and do all that work first. Uh, that would be what I would consider sort of some global editing. Uh, but since we did so much of that in the beginning of the semester, uh, let's get in a little bit closer and um, uh, do a little bit of repair work on this image. Now, anything that we do to uh, sort of fix uh, blemishes in the skin or dust flex or something like that, they're going to be permanent edits to this photograph. And so just in case, um, you know, we goof it up or we're still practicing, let's do a Command J and duplicate our background layer. Now, um, when, uh, when you photograph your friends, when you photograph family, um, this is a bit of a delicate dance between, um, uh, you know, airbrushing them and kind of turning them into Barbie dolls versus kind of presenting them in, in their best light or truest light. Uh, so be careful with this information, but let's just say, for example, that I woke up this morning and had a colossal, you know, pimple exploding on the side of my cheek and, oh no, it was a portrait day. Um, how would I get rid of that? Now, this isn't a pimple, right? It's a freckle or something, but let's just say, for example, it's a blemish that um, I didn't want in this photograph. Well, I'm going to use Command plus 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 to zoom in, and this is probably a little bit too close, somewhere in there, and I want to get like a reasonably um, uh, close view at what I'm working on so that I don't, um, I don't end up editing too much of the image. And I'm going to use the patch tool. Keyboard shortcut for that is J. It's likely hiding underneath your spot healing brush, your healing brush tool. I find that the patch tool is one of the easiest um, uh, sort of repair tools to work with. Uh, I'm just going to draw a circle around whatever it is that I want to fix and drag that circle to another part of the photograph. And what I'm looking for here is I'm trying to roughly match skin tone and texture, so the lightness and darkness. So the closer I can get to the original patch, the better. I'm just going to kind of work it right in here. And as soon as I let go, uh, Photoshop automatically blends that in. Command D, deselect, and you'd never know that that, uh, that that freckle was ever there. Now, the reason I have uh, two layers here is that I can toggle back and forth between um, uh, previous, uh, sort of like the original photograph and my retouched one. So uh, let's just say, for example, I really uh, wish I had shaved this morning. I could potentially right go in and carefully and painstakingly remove every single errant whisker on this. Um, this kind of photo editing, I have to say, um, is more common in like magazine photographs and the kind of like airbrushed images you see uh, and Hollywood stars. I, I find it to be really difficult work to do. I don't have much patience for that kind of stuff. But um, if it is something like um, a blemish that shouldn't, uh, sh shouldn't be there in a particular kind of photograph, I would say go ahead and patch tool those things out. 
um, things like scars, right? Scars are, um, are often uh, descriptive of someone's personality. I would definitely leave those in. Uh, but a giant smudge, you know, on my glasses, uh, that should probably be, you know, that could probably be taken out so that it's not quite so distracting in the image. Uh, something that might actually prevent um, the viewer from getting an honest view at, uh, um, at uh, the subject of the photograph is usually where I draw that line in my own personal work. Now, if I'm not using the black, the patch tool, uh, I'm probably using the clone stamp. And the clone stamp works particularly well in areas like this hair that is kind of like coming down. Now, uh, I really got no problem with this hair, but it is a perfect example of where I might use the clone stamp to do a repair instead of the patch tool. This is quite a bit of space uh, for the patch tool to work with. Uh, so instead, I'm going to use the clone stamp and I'm going to hold Option or Alt and basically select a target uh, a sort of a target patch or a target clone just next door and I'll pull that clone information right over and the reason I like the clone stamp is I can uh, sort of live brush with it. Oops, I went right off the page here. Uh, so I can actually kind of drag that edit right up through so it works really well for like larger areas. It basically just copies the target zone onto, um, uh, onto uh, whatever it is that you're trying to repair. The other cool thing about the clone stamp is I like up here in the options bar that I can turn down the opacity. So if I don't really want to completely blow it out, I just want to knock it down. Uh, this is actually how I typically would deal with um, uh, somebody who has uh, a lot of blemishes on their skin is I wouldn't necessarily go in and airbrush everything out to make them look perfect, but I might take like a 50% clone stamp opacity and just kind of knock it down a little bit so that it's maybe not quite as intense as it was the first time. Uh, you'll find that um, I find anyway that people sort of prefer to be cleaned up, not completely airbrushed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, 50% opacity clone stamp is a nice way to do that. Uh, once I've done all of the patching and cloning that I might need to do in the image, and, you know, it, it might even might not even be skin, it might be something, you know, on the wall, it might be a, a cable that was hanging in or, you know, something on, uh, in the background that you don't want there. But once all that is done, uh, I generally merge the two background layers. Hold Shift to select two layers, right click, and merge. Uh, from here, uh, I'll do any, um, any other exposure work that I need to do or color correction. So uh, I'm going to get a good selection of just myself here and correct this sort of blue tone that's in the background. I think I'll start by using a quick select tool, a quick selection, keyboard shortcut for that is W. Increase my brush size and do a reasonably accurate selection of myself here against that soft background. And then zoom in just a little bit more shrink the brush and bring that selection line, that scrolling marquee line out to the edge as best I can and where it's particularly uh, tricky would be in uh, my hairline and I'll show you in another image uh, how nice that is. But so anytime I want to do a sort of like a, a subject background selection like this, I'm always really careful to uh, soften my selection even further. Now, because I photographed this image with a narrow depth of field, my edge is already pretty blurry, uh, but I'm going to go into now select and mask and modify this selection edge so that it's nice and soft. Uh, I like to view my selection edge as an overlay, V, and just in case, uh, you know, I didn't quite have a perfect selection here. I like to turn on a little uh, edge detection with the smart radius. That modifies my selection edge a little bit. And then anywhere that I might want to refine that otherwise really hard edge, uh, back here along my blurry hair is a great example. Uh, I use this brush option up here on the upper left, the refine edge tool, what I used to call the hair tool. And just click and drag right over that edge and uh, Photoshop does a little bit of magic to sort of blend in and find those edges. Now this tool I think came into existence primarily for uh, people who were making hard difficult selections around people's hair. Uh, when Photoshop first came out, right, I was watching people try to edit it out by literally brushing in each individual hair and stuff. And, you know, lo and behold, a couple years of doing that, and somebody designed this Refine Edge tool. And now I don't know if anybody's hand brushing out, you know, hair by hair by hair on these difficult selections. Uh, they just kind of run this edge selection brush or edge refine brush. And, you know, it's finding individual whisker hairs and kind of getting into all the nooks and crannies. As long as my initial selection is fairly accurate, 
this edge, this refine edge tool is really great at, um, at sort of picking up all those little edges and softening any hard edge selections. Click OK. Now, why am I making a selection of myself here? Um, I mentioned before that I, I'm not crazy about the sort of blue tint that showed up in the background. When I uh, did the white balance correction for my skin here, it threw uh, what should be just sort of a gray-white background into kind of a blue cast. Uh, maybe the easiest way to color correct that would just be to desaturate it, uh, but I'll show you two different ways. So I'll click Hue Saturation, and the first thing you notice is that automatically um, that selection ends up in uh, the layer mask. That's really handy. Uh, now I'm just going to desaturate it. Now, oops, I accidentally desaturated myself instead of my background. Well, that's okay. I, now that I have this really great selection, I can use it for a bunch of different things. So I'm going to go to Select, Inverse, oops. I'm going to Command Z that. Go here, Command I. That's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to invert. So I'm going to go over to my uh, layer mask here and do a Command I inverse, and it just flips now that uh, desaturation edit to the background. That's pretty subtle. I didn't desaturate it too much, um, but let me do uh, another edit here that is a little bit more obvious. I'll open up my uh, curves palette and I would like to use this same layer mask to edit the background and make the background a little bit lighter or a little bit darker. I'll start with lighter and instead of having to remake that whole selection I'm just going to copy this mask by holding option click and drag. That way I don't have to remake that same selection over and over and over again. Uh, so I'll show it to you in real time how I'm now going to just be able to edit that background, make it a little darker than it was, make it a little lighter than it was. Uh, I think what it was is it got a little bit too light, and it was too light and too blue. So I'll go back into my saturation and pull out just even a little bit more. There we go. So that's feeling a little bit better. Um, before those edits, it was feeling a little too blue, a little bit too light, and after. From here, I might come in and do some selective exposure edits. Um, oftentimes, uh, now my eyes are a little bit obscured here, but um, in, uh, in this photograph, which was from the same session, uh, I used a little bit of um, uh, a curves adjustment layer to sort of open up just that tiny little bit of, uh, of shadows that end up in my, uh, that sort of got cast by my eyebrow. Um, I like to open up the sub my subject eyes just a little bit. Uh, don't go overboard here. Generally, it's not the entire eyeball. It's only the lower half of the eyeball that should be catching the light. The upper half of the eyeball has a shadow that cuts across it, and that shadow is really important. Um, at this point, that's probably more like um, digital painting than photography skills, but I find that to be a really handy tip um, not to over-brighten eyes, to just to hit the underside of the iris. Um, and then in this image here, what I might then do is um, uh, begin by thinking about uh, adding color effects. Now, this is something I tend to um, shy away from a little bit, um, especially in some of the LUTs or the sort of profiles that are built into Photoshop. But I'll show you one that I use occasionally, and then I'll show you some of the profiles and let you make your own decisions about it. So I'm going to come in here, add a hue saturation layer, colorize it, duck the, opacity, or duck the saturation a bit, and then... Uh, depending on the skin tone of my subject, adjust uh, my saturation or adjust my hue slider to something that'll be a little bit more flattering. And switch the blending mode from normal to overlay. Now, at first flush, that's a little intense, uh, but it's going to give this um, sort of deeply cinematic feel. I'm going to duck the overall opacity of that layer and bring that way back. And essentially what I want to do is bring a little bit of character to the skin tones um, of my subject. And in the process, I'll likely goof on some areas, right? Like the highlight on my forehead and my nose get a little too hot. And so I come in with a brush then and uh, and soften those out, maybe a 50% opacity brush, sort of soften out parts of the image that uh, got a little bit too hot in there. And if I didn't want that effect to change the background, I might just kind of um, use that same selection mask again and, and modify the background. 
Uh, the last thing I might do is add just a little bit of sharpness, but because my eyes are sort of hiding behind my glasses in this image, I'm going to avoid the sharpness. But in this image, you can see that um, I added just a bit of sharpness to the eyes here by adding a hue saturation, or sorry, by adding a high pass filter and then selectively editing in just the area that I thought could use a bit of extra sharpness. Now be careful with this as a reminder guys, you can't sharpen uh, photographic images that are already blurry. Um, if they're blurry because of a lens, uh, a lens blur or bokeh, like the back of my head or the scarf, you can't bring those back into focus in Photoshop. There's no way to do that. You can only kind of crispen up things that are already in focus. So I'm excited to see what you guys come up with uh, through your own self-portrait shoots. Um, these ones are fun to sort of get us, uh, get us some practice before we go out and start photographing friends and family.